Hi, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the final session, indeed, of the uh, second Global Veg Fest, uh, free to access online. We've had a whole weekend, a wonderful weekend this weekend, December 18th, 19th, 2021. Activists and individuals across the globe joining us for a number of panels and live streams, discussions, some entertainment. We've had some cookery demos, some uh, discussions about health. Uh, we've had some discussions about some of the moral aspects of veganism and animal rights. And now uh, we're going to look at um, a couple of aspects of plants. It's going to be really interesting. Um, before uh, our second session, I should say, we'll be uh, focusing on the plant-based treaty. Um, and we will be joined uh, by Anita Kranz from Toronto, who will be uh, talking to us about the plant-based treaty. Um, and that'll be in about 30 minutes, uh, 25, 30 minutes. But before that, um, we're going to welcome our first guest, Ellen Tout. And Ellen is joining us um, tell us where from very shortly. And Ellen, you are a published author. Your book is about complete eating. And you're going to tell us all about what, what this is about. So, Ellen. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so this is my book. It's the complete book of vegan completing. And as you said, it's all about completing, which is eating all parts of your fruit and veg and making use of the parts that you might normally sort of throw away without realising are really tasty and useful. That's really fascinating. And I must say, since coming across your book and yourself about this, and I think we featured you in our magazine, Plant Power Planet Online, uh, issue three, which is out about, um, and it's, this is this is a whole concept. And, it, and it's as we'll come to in our, in our little discussion, a really important one. Um, but essentially, it's about using up all of the food uh, product that, that that we would perhaps then consider throwing away. Um, so complete eating, completing the books out. You know, it's a vegan book, obviously, and Ellen yeah. also is vegan. So, um, and I think you've got some slides. I think so. That, that are yeah, yes. so go through some slides and then have a little chat about the book. So, Ellen, take it away. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, this is me. I'm Ellen Tout and I'm a sustainability writer. So I've been writing about sustainability for magazines and charities and things like that for about five years now. And I'm vegan, so I'm especially interested in food and food waste was a topic that I started writing a bit about. And I realised that, although it was really interesting to me, there was sort of a lack of resources about how people could take sort of practical steps to make a difference. Um, food waste, it plays a really, really big role in emissions and in climate change. But I just felt that I, despite writing about this, I wasn't kind of as aware. So maybe other people weren't as well. And that there were sort of resources here and there, but not that many and any that were we're definitely not vegan. Um, yeah, the next slide, please. And it's my book, which came out a couple of months ago. And yeah, it was kind of the culmination of writing about it lots more and realizing that I'd always wanted to write a book. And I sort of was searching for resources in books like this, and there wasn't one. So I thought, well, I'm going to give it a shot and write one. Um, and a small publisher's really loved the concept and yeah but then the next slide please you're probably thinking you know what exactly is completing like what does it actually involve so the kind of dictionary definition is eating all edible parts of fruits vegetables and herbs so it's a concept that a campaign called love food hate waste it's all coined but they include meat and dairy and things like that and like i said as a vegan i wanted a vegan resource and i think as well like it makes more sense if it's fruit and veg and plant-based because you've got things like peels and tops and seeds and um, roots cores all of those can be included in completing um so we go to the next slide please now here's my sort of 
fave list of completing. So seeds, you've got things like pumpkin seeds, squash seeds, melon seeds. You might often buy those from a health food shop. Um, but when you've got your own pumpkin or melon there, you can just as easily eat those. You can roast them and toast them and things like that. And they're really tasty and they're also really nutritious. Um, your skins and peels, you've got root vegetable peels. You can make things like crisps, um, onion skins and garlic skins. You can make broth and stocks for soups and to use like you might a shop bought stock. Um, cores. You can make lots of things from. Um, one I was really surprised by, you can use apple cores to make apple cider vinegar, um, which you can use in lots of things, but that's a common ingredient in vegan baking, so that's quite a nice one to be able to make. Um, tops I mentioned, by that I mean like the leafy bits on top of carrots or beetroot, radishes, turnips, all of those are tasty. And I think what interested me a lot is that these things are flavoursome, but we're throwing them away. But also a lot of them, that's where so much more of the nutrients is. Um, so tops, they're just as tasty as um, and healthy as spinach or greens that we might buy. So it's sort of about rethinking the way that we're cooking. That's kind of what I enjoyed, that I started looking at my ingredients differently and thinking, you know, why do we throw this away? Why does a cookbook say, you know, chop that off, chop that off? It's sort of what we've been taught, but actually a lot of what we're throwing away is still really good food. Um, the aquafaba I've included there, because that's obviously one that's got a lot of press and really popular among vegans. Um, so that's the liquid from a can of chickpeas and that can be used for so many things, um, yeah. And there's lots, lots more. Um, so the next slide, please. So I've kind of touched on this, but why would you bother completing? Um, it's reducing food waste, which is great environmentally and ethically, but also it's kind of it's a creative and fun way to start making a difference. As a sustainability writer, I think a lot of the things that I write about can feel quite overwhelming or like, it's a sort of a bigger picture thing or like quite a big commitment or a chore sort of um like giving up flying people might not want to do that or it might feel like a negative thing whereas if you're vegan you hopefully quite like food and cooking so it's kind of a, a fun and an accessible thing that we can all start doing a bit of um yeah if you're saving waste then you're also saving a bit of money as well so it's something that's sort of free to do as well um, and as I said a lot of the parts have a lot of nutrients in as well um, for the next slide please yeah food waste um, from an environmental perspective it is a big problem and that's why I wanted to write about it especially um, I think sometimes you think it's an ethical issue you know it's not right to throw food away yeah, obviously, but um, it's also responsible for between 8 and 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And that's actually the same amount as the entire aviation industry globally. So it is playing a really big role in the climate crisis. And I think it's just not something that's getting... So you've kind of got your buzzword topics and it's not sort of mentioned as much. And that's why I wanted to, to talk about it more. Um, yeah, the next slide, please. So 70% of the food that's wasted around the world could have been eaten. Um, it's obviously wasted for various different reasons, but some of those parts are the parts that I listed earlier. So completing, you're sort of incorporating those parts. And I'd like to think if we all started doing that from our kitchens, then that number is going to start going down. Um, so the next slide, please. And these are just some of my my recipes from my Instagram, um, and they're all using the sort of more in unusual parts. Um, the top left, that's a ravioli where I've used aquafaba instead of eggs in the dough to make like a pasta dough. Um, and that's stuffed with um, roasted butternut squash. The next one along is cauliflower leaves, and they stuffed with cauliflower. Um, 
I think a lot of people just have a cauliflower and take those bits off, but you can use the leaves for a lot of things. Um, and then I've got a soup with um, crisps made from peels and seeds from a squash as a topping. Um, the bottom left, that's carrot peel made into locks, um, sort of like smoked salmon, so you put it in um, liquid smoke and soy sauce and things like that. Um, the next one in the bottom middle, that's corn husks. Um, they're not actually edible, the bits from the outside of the corn on the cob, but you can use them for a lot of things as a parcel or to make broth and things like that. And they're really, really flavoursome. And the last one is called banana peel, and that's marinated in a barbecue sauce, kind of like um, called jackfruit. Yeah, that's just a small sort of taster to show that you're not just sort of eating scraps for the sake of it. You can make really, really nice things. And the last slide, I think, is now for this. And yeah, that's my book. <laughs> Thank you. Um, back to you. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting, Ellen. That's uh, a really good little uh, introduction to your work, though. But especially the um, dishes at the end—they uh, they were quite, quite, quite interesting. Certainly, you know, I think if we think food waste, we sort of think not perhaps not much further than, than ca ca carrot tops and potato peelings. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> but. Um, that was really some quite interesting kind of, you know, look. So the whole concept is really, really cool. Thank and you. I think you mentioned that it's sort of culturally, you know, we, we, don't, we just don't think about this. Mm. And, and I agree. I think, think about it, we would think, oh, you know, like the idea of having to eat food scraps is like, oh, is, I suppose, introduced the idea of what can we afford to perhaps eat, you know, proper food, as it were. And it's like, well, A, no, a lot of people can't. And B, mm we shouldn't be um looking at it from that we should be looking at how can we make the most of, of what we've got and that's a staggering figure 70 percent um of, of food waste um but, but i would have to say that i i've never i mean i do get as far as sort of you know broccoli broccoli a lot of broccoli so it's just kind of find some interesting things to do with the stalks as, as it were, the, the, you know, the, the stems. Is the yeah. yeah. Um, just out of interest, what about juicing some of this stuff? Does that kind of, is that a view? Is that, I mean, I think the trouble with juicing stuff is it can probably taste revolting. Yeah. And I think it, people with juices, I think often they, if they sort of spit out a bit, don't they? So they make a bit yeah. in themselves. I, the food waste, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I put a lot of sort of the weird bits that you think I don't know what to do with that in a soup and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So I guess that's a good way. To yeah. Hide. Um, I make a lot of stock as well, so I always have a freezer bag and I put onion skins and sort of random off cuts and ends in there, and then I keep that in the freezer. And once every couple of weeks, I simmer all of that up and make a big stock. So that's quite a good way to make use of it without um, sort of the bits that you think, I really don't know what to do with this. And at least you're still giving it some kind of purpose. Yeah, that's really, that's, that is quite, quite, quite clever. And we were <laughs> talking earlier on an earlier panel about the importance of education, just to, just to basic cooking skills, you know, but mm. we talk about affordability and accessibility. And of course, you know, vegan diet, plant-based diets are primarily fruit vegetables seeds nuts beans pulses mm. and, um, and something else grains yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and um in their in their um natural state of course a lot of these have a long shelf life uh, mm. they're durable they're, they're easily grown they're easily harvestable and storable mm. uh, they don't require you know a lot of perhaps necessarily transportation or refrigeration and processing but they do require some cooking skills um, mm. and that's that's key to to avoiding sort of processed and westernized plant-based food and keeping to local traditional uh, ingredients that are easily readily available but are plant-based and not animal-based um 
And this whole idea of taking it a step further and really optimizing the use of it um, it was probably something I know that I'm sure my, my, my grandparents would have done during the war. Mm -hmm. My parents, uh, even during the Second World War, they would have been optimizing every part of every vegetable and mm -hmm. every piece of, you know, and, and it seems to be something we kind of lost, you know, that. So it's fabulous to see it coming back. Let me just ask you quickly about um, what's, your, what's your tip for somebody who's going to be new to this? What's a really easy one to get started? Um vegetable peel crisps is really really easy um i tend not to peel a lot of root vegetables now but if you do um yeah so potato peels carrot peels parsnip peels um toss them in a little bit of oil i like putting some garlic salt on them um and then you just roast them on the tray for 10 minutes in the oven um 180 ish and they're you know homemade crisps that are really tasty and you've avoided the waste so yeah that's a really really simple one to start doing i think quite a simple one too is to kind of not peel your vegetables to begin with yeah. is to try you know again if i'm thinking back you know it's just sort of brought up to peel peel carrots and yeah. potatoes i mean i personally never do i just throw them in the pot and, and cook them up and um, uh, you know Probably not even averse to but if there's a bit of organic mud or something on there. I mean, I scrub them, but I don't scrub them to pieces to the point where they're you know, you're sort of scrubbing off the skins almost. So, um, yeah, uh, that's one thing, of course, is to just not peel them at all in the first place, throw them in the pot. And, um, yeah, uh, what else? Give us another one. Perhaps seasonal. Have you got a seasonal? Or maybe seasonal. Does that put you on the spot? The seasonal. Yeah. List? <laughs> um, so sprouts. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people at Christmas buy the big stalk of sprouts. Um, oh, the last yes. year I was kind of having an experiment, and you can eat the, the massive, massive stalk as well. But equally, just when you're preparing your sprouts, I think I'm a bit like you when I'm cooking. I think if it saves me time and I don't need to do it, there's unless the, the sprouts are really, really sort of yellow or tatty. There's no need to do the whole chopping the end off every right. sprout, right. doing the cross, peeling them, because that's half of the sprouts wasted. Um, so, yeah, for Christmas, it'd be nice if everyone wasn't chucking half of them away. Um, but, yeah, I did do a whole roasted sprout stalk. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you need one that isn't too big. It needs to fit in your oven. But, um, yeah, it's really, really tasty. And it was one of the recipes that I tried that I was a bit i'm sure is this going to work but yeah very very tasty so that's sort of a different one christmas um i've also roasted sprouts just whole with yeah. lots of nuts and um swede with the skin on all roasted in a dish together and that's tasty and quite an easy thing to do so you're just you're saving time aren't you because you haven't got to peel it as well um yeah and, and of course, also this another thing is to eat eat the fruit and vegetables quite quickly so that you don't mm. have to waste them. Uh, but of course, if you do, I mean, I'm finding you know, uh, it's a good time to be putting out the old bit of fruit for for the birds and for the wild animals and stuff, especially mm. the birds at the moment if it gets a bit uh, solid with the ground. You know, some some slightly aging fruit is mm. is always good for 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 our for our wildlife. Um, so. That's what I'm thinking, but that's really interesting. Is there anything we should avoid? Is there a is there a warning about you know some of some of the things we should maybe not consume? Yeah, there was only a few things I came across when I was writing my book. Um, so there's rhubarb, the actual leaves you can't eat. Um, that's what that's it's there. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> absolutely fun. Sounds fun. It should be banned from the face of the earth. Yeah. Well, no, it was a bit extreme, maybe. Yeah. Um, I'm I mean, sorry if anybody likes rhubarb, yeah. but that's, that's interesting, though. So, rhubarb leaves are a no yeah. Are they yeah. poisonous? Yes, they are. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else is that? The tops. Of, so, a lot of root vegetables, you can eat the leafy tops, um, but parsnips, you can't. Okay. Um, they're also poisonous, which is weird because. Right. Carrots, Swede, all of those you can, but yeah. avoid parsnips. Okay. 
and the if you've got tomatoes on a vine you can actually use the vine um to marinate it in a sauce to infuse some flavor but you can't eat it um so that's one that i would just discuss that's poisonous as well um i think there are three that come to mind it's a question that i get asked quite often but actually most things if you sort of cook them in the right way and check you you can um yeah yeah, I suppose you've got to be a little bit cautious. You've got to find your way into some of this too, because mm. I guess some of the, I'm thinking about some bits and bobs can be quite woody or quite fibrous or quite chewy or quite, you know, quite quite not not necessarily that that appetising, even if if kind of cooked, you know. Um, I yeah. suppose if you think about some of like some very stringy beans that are, yeah, you know, oh old and stringy, you can't halfway through it's like, it's a little bit worthy you've got to chew through this yeah fibrous content but you know it's kind of doing it good so it's, it's probably not a bad thing but but it's probably not what you choose necessarily maybe not to serve to guests but yeah. if you were serving to guests and or what you know what was going to be your favorite what would you do to impress somebody and really win them over with a, with a fabulously appetizing um dish that then revealed to be actually made out of anyway you know Take your pivot or something. Yeah. What, what would you go um, for? One of my favourites is one that I mentioned earlier, which is the ravioli um, made from aquafaba. Um, I think that's something that people often pour away and you might not think you could use. Um, but I think the ravioli is sort of quite, it looks fancy. So it's nice to say this is just made from a waste product. <coughs> um, and the filling is using. The skin and the whole butternut squash roasted with <coughs> age. Um, yeah so i think that's one that looks quite impressive um one of my other favorite ones is a whole orange cake which has literally got a whole orange put in the blender and blended in with the cake dough um and that's super tasty kind of like a lemon drizzle cake um so you could do the same thing with a lemon um yeah. Well, that's interesting because you touched on it in your slideshow about the extra nutrition. Mm. Sometimes it's a nutrition. I think we know this, you know, I was always brought up to eat my apple cores mm. uh, because there was nutrition in the cores and there was enzymes, I think, that helped with, you know, I'm sure there's some science behind it that, mm. that I'm, I'm oblivious to, but something along those lines. Um, uh, but 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 um, interestingly too, because you mentioned the whole orange there, the, the idea of the whole orange. Now, again, I've got to be careful here. I don't want to mislead and misclaim, but I do remember an um, interesting neighbour of mine who made discoveries some 20 years ago about how there was sort of cancer preventative um, material to be found in, in interesting tangerine skins. I think it was identified and he'd isolated some some quite strong sort of protection, protecting nutrients that would protect against the genetic diseases that were found in tangerine poo. Um, I hope I've got that correct. Or forgive me if I've, if I've misquoted that anybody. Uh, it is from memory. But, um, you know, there are, I believe, some quite quite interesting nutrients to be found in, in some food waste. Yeah, definitely. Um two that I can think of off the top of my head were um, kiwi skins. They've got um, certain vitamins and minerals. I can't remember off the top of my head, so I won't say it wrong, but they've got them purely found in kiwi skins that you can't get them anywhere else. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So kiwi skins, they've got lots and lots of goodness in. Um, also the cause of pineapples. I think pineapple core is <laughs> um yeah so there's loads of goodness often found in the skins and the seeds and places like that um that you might not think to look um so yeah that's a really good reason to incorporate into your food you're fine oh, i think sorry about that <laughs> i have to shoot off have an interrupting phone call that's know. okay that's, 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 uh... So that's interesting that they say they say you know there are additional nutrients and such like to be found. Yeah. So it can be quite healthy too, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, 
What about uh, the organic uh, issue? Is it is is organic? You know, especially when we think about perhaps something like skins of fruits or something, it could be quite high in maybe pesticide content and such like. What's the organic? What's your take on that aspect? Yeah, so I'd say in an ideal world, you know, buy everything organic. Um, but for people who can't, if you're going to be eating the skins, I'd say to sort of prioritise those as your your go-to organic ones. Um, if not, um, there's a certain amount of evidence to say that if you can scrub all of the skins and if you also want to soak them in water with a bit of bicarbonate, that's quite good for sort of removing any harmful okay. pesticides and residues before you eat them. Um, and I also have included in my book the sort of research by the Pesticide Action Research Network and they've sort of got a really good list of the produce that's higher in pesticides compared to other Yes. Yeah, yes. that's a useful resource. Something like, I think, just off the top of my head, something you find like garlic mm. and avocados have a very, very low residue. Mm. Uh, so, so, whereas something like perhaps strawberries, mm. yeah, especially yeah. the pores in the strawberries, you know, they will quite possibly collect quite a mm. high concentration. So, it's a very valid point. It could be a quite a disparity between, you know, so. Certain non organic substances. So that's an interesting area. And I'm, I'm glad to say that my colleagues just confirmed to me that I was correct about the tangerine peel. Oh, um, right. uh, a compound uh, extracted from tangerine peel can kill certain human cancer cells. Research shown from the Leicester School of Pharmacy found that Salvastrol Q40 was turned into a toxic compound in cancer cells, destroying them. And Salvastrol Q40 is found at higher concentrations in tangerine peel uh, rather than in the flesh of the fruit. Right. So, that's, so that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I know too something like lycopene, which um, is, is a really important nutrient for, um, for, for men, especially because of beneficial effects on the prostate. Um, mm. And that's found very much in concentrated um, tomatoes as opposed to fresh tomatoes, where you would think, oh, you know, the fresh tomato is going to have mm. uh, Actually, no, the, the, the tomato puree, I believe, is the, uh, the concentrate, you know. So, so it's an interesting thing. Again, it's a kind of just an indication uh, uh, that, that there's, there's, there's quite a lot new, really, to understand about our food, nutrients, mm. and how we, how we use it and, and what i really love about this too and, and, um, and as you know we have waiting in the wings anita from the plant-based treaty is going to um, come on shortly um is that that you know i think one of the one of the things people find about how climate change um is how overwhelming it is and how powerless mm. we feel and, and how let down we feel especially with the livestock farming issue which we literally saw kind of getting taken back off the agenda at COP26 by the request of various governments and sort of review. There and there, and the BBC, you know, showed this. That it really put the, 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 the you know, the, um, the spotlight on the need for community action, community-based action, for people power, for people to really take control of the situation and make these demands. And, of course, I think we know that governments and organizations and systems quite often do respond to consumer demand mm. uh, and, 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 and increased education and awareness of these things. So, uh, but, but the idea of like introducing something you can kind of do on a daily basis, you know, especially if you're already vegan or following a plant-based diet, it's like, wow, mm. this is really interesting. And I think you can take this knowledge too into you know, schools, into institutions, this could be uh, a real benefit for people, uh, skills to learn. Um, so it's an absolutely fascinating area. I'm really grateful for you. For, for, uh, tell, us, tell us where we could uh, find out a bit more about this too. Yeah. So um, you can find me on all of the normal social media places. Um, and I've got a website which has got various recipes and tips on it. 
Um, I've got lots of recipes on my Instagram. And then, yeah, the complete book of vegan completing. And, yeah, also the Love Food Hate Waste website. I definitely recommend. But, um, yeah, for sort of a, a starter on completing. But obviously it's not it's not vegan completely. I think it's a great, great gift for great gift. We've been talking about gift, the gift of knowledge this 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 season of yeah. Google, rather than any kind of consumer items if we're looking to give ethical gifts. And you know, this is a really, really good one. And I think oh, it's, it's really good for sort of kids and teenagers too. It's, it's a, and, and older people too, perhaps they've got uh, uh you know, uh such so a sort of new hobby to get into, is it would be brilliant, it would be very really stretchy. I think it's lovely that it's practical, that it's something you can do and work and include in your community. And before we go, Eleanor, there is one more question I really want to just touch on. is about the sort of um, you know, the environmental impact of food waste. I mean, people may say, oh, you know, I compost all my, my potato peelings and they kind of, you know, et cetera. It's not really an issue here. What, 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 how big an issue is this? Because, you know, with climate change i think anything yeah. we can really do is is important but how, yeah. how would you highlight this issue there um i think the stats that really shocked me were the the eight to ten percent of global greenhouse gas emissions come from our food waste i think often people think like it doesn't really matter if i chuck this away or that away but um it really does um but I think also, like you said, it can feel like a lot of pressure to do things, whereas this is sort of something a bit more creative. Um, but something that people often say is, well, I compost all of my scraps. And if you've got, you know, your own plot of land and your own composting system at home, that's, you know, that's amazing. That's sort of the goal for all of us, I guess, the gold star. Um, but I think an issue that I've seen a of cropping up is that a lot of people don't even have food waste collections at home um in the uk alone all of the councils have different rules and regulations what they do collect a lot of cities lots of places in london especially um they don't collect food waste so that's you know if it's going in your bin then it goes to landfill and that releases a lot of methane which is one of the most potent greenhouse gases because when food is in landfill it can't break down naturally so i think sort of the inconsistency from what local authorities are doing is one of the problems um but also if you are putting food in your food waste there's obviously been a lot of energy going into growing that food already so kind of my take is to get the most out of it that you can yeah. before you throw it out yeah that, I like that. It's a guiding principle, really, and I think that's that's really the whole point of this. Really, is it's it's a, it's a guiding principle. It's a principle that you know you don't have to every every time eat. You know, you don't have to be sort of puritanical about this or, or particularly strict in discipline. But it's a great concept. It's a great way of thinking. And I think it's great things to share with communities too. It's just to kind of introduce as a way of thinking. Like, look, one solution is just useless and optimize. Yeah, and and for those of us who are lucky enough to get you know access to food and can eat two three meals a day, mm -hmm. I think too it's a it's a it's a really you know fundamental um, act of of consideration um, mm -hmm. for, for sort of your own sort of version of food justice really is is to, to is to honour and respect the fact that there's a huge amount of people who do not get uh, that and even in the UK as we know it's highly rated by Marcus Rashford and, and many charities and such, there's, there's some real food poverty. And I think it is, you know, absolutely clear that if, you, if you've got access to food and you've got regular food, you should do your very best to not, mm -hmm. not waste that yourself, but to encourage that as a regular to be um, adopting that as a principle. Yeah. I think, yeah. Thank you. No, Alan, do. Yeah, do, 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 no, do. I was just going to say, I think, Last year, when we first had the lockdowns in the UK, yes. we started realising that food isn't always just there. You know, we couldn't get toilet rolls and chopped tomatoes. And I think that sort of made people appreciate it a bit more. And maybe on the whole, people already kind of starting to forget that again. And I think sort of 
we need to get back that sort of connection with our food and appreciation for it. Um, maybe vegans less so, but on the whole, I think people are so used to popping to the shop and getting this and that. So throwing it away sometimes doesn't feel like a problem, but yeah. It is. Here's the solution. So well done. Yeah. There we are, running across the bottom. Ellen's book, The Complete Book of Vegan Completing, is available from Waterstones and Blackwells and Ellen's website, ellentab.co.uk. And that's where you can go to find more about it. Thank you, Ellen. It's been brilliant. It's been a really interesting half hour. Thank you. And um, there's your article too, Plant Power Planet. If people want to read the Plant Power Planet issue three, it's free to read online. You can read about Ellen a bit more there too. Thanks Thank so you. Much, Lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Oh, that was really interesting. What a great way to spend a Sunday afternoon talking to people like Ellen, who are full of really interesting uh, things. And that really is great. You know, something you're going to think quite quite carefully about. So I've tried to put, put that into process. Uh, so talking of really interesting people, our next guest, and indeed our final guest for this Global Veg Fest December 21, uh, is Anita Krantz from joining us from Toronto. Anita is famous actually as part of the Toronto Save, uh, I think the, the Save movement especially, but recently working with the Plant Based Treaty, which is uh, something Anita will tell us more about, but I can tell you it's sort of taken off really rapidly in the last few months. Um, we saw that in the vote actually on the awards. We had the Club Based Treaty up for the award, and it well, actually, it was going to win it right up until the last minute. Um, Anita, thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome to Global Veg Fest. Hi, Tim. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, so, Anita, you're as we said, you wear many, many hats, as it were, within the, the animal protection, the animal liberation movement. Um, this one's particularly fresh and, and kind of new. So would you like to just introduce first, just uh, tell people very briefly what the plant-based treaty is? And then um, well, yes. you've got some slides for us, I think. Yeah, so um, the plant-based treaty was introduced uh, late August and uh, we um, came up with the idea in late April um, when we met with uh, the chair of the fossil fuel treaty. Uh, Sephora Berman and um, the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty has this bottom-up campaign to uh, get people to not make the problem worse and redirect subsidies and you know have a transition to a soft energy path. So with a plant-based treaty we basically copied that and uh, we're trying to create this bottom-up pressure campaign with millions of people signing on thousands of businesses, thousands of groups, dozens of cities, and uh, putting on pressure on national governments to negotiate a global plant-based treaty that would accompany the Paris Climate Accords. And historically, uh, in order to get some important global legislation, uh, movements often start at the local level. So for example, in getting the global agreement to protect the ozone layer, there were resolutions that were passed at the city level, such as Boston, and then uh, a number of other cities, and then at the state level, like Massachusetts. And then the national governments sort of uh, were motivated to negotiate a global agreement. So we're, we're following that same uh, model. And um, what I like about the global plant-based treaty model is that on the one hand, we're trying to get this global agreement, but then on the other hand, there's also all these guides for everyone to, to participate in. Like there are things that schools, businesses, communities, hospitals can do, and all of that is on the website as well. So you can endorse the treaty to put pressure on uh, for a global agreement, but you can also go beyond that and participate, uh, you know, doing things at schools, such as um, growing community gardens and things like that. 
Well, we've, we've certainly seen some, some you know, people have been quite busy in the UK uh, with, with the plant-based treaty and it, and it really seems to gain some traction. And uh, I think the key, the key thing too is that a lot of people are collaborating um, under this. And I think it's, it's fair to say, um, you may not agree or not, but possibly, I would say it's fair to say that you know, something that the, the vegan and animal rights and animal liberation movement has lacked is sometimes been a really, you know, like a clear, clear direction um, that people can really, you know, gather under and pin, pin their colours to, if you like. But the, the beauty about the plant-based treaty is that it's a very um, broad tent, and that plant-based is is um, it's got a lot of very strong attractions, uh, and and something that, that that is very easy to to collaborate under. Um, and and uh, we've seen a real traction really quickly. There's there's been some real quick quick ground made, um, and I think especially we saw at the COP twenty six. Uh, there was some really strong collaborations going on there, j just as well. Really. Um, so, and then, have you got? I think you've got some slides or a presentation. Did you want to? Um... Yes, yes. And um, you know, I think you're exactly right about the the potential for a big tent with this this campaign. And uh, yeah, so I just want to show you some slides now. Um, yeah, this, this uh, yes, nice. This is um, so. Good. Yeah, so we have a website, plantbasedtreaty.org, and uh, in the next slide you'll see um, Sephora Berman, who we met with in late April of this year, and she's the chair of the Fossil Fuel Treaty, and uh, they created an arm's length campaign, so she's with Stand Earth, but an arm's length campaign that anyone could run with. So we did the same thing with plant-based treaty. We do not associate it with animal safe movement. It's like a lot of our uh team is working very hard on it but we wanted to create something separate where anyone could join and that lends itself to collaboration and this is what the fossil fuel treaty taught us so again we copied that idea um so in the next slide uh you'll see this is our this is our sort of the team that's working on it um and it's always expanding and uh we have like a graphics team a website team a branding team we branded it completely separate from animal safe movement so the colors actually come from potatoes in ecuador so and we have all these beautiful biodiverse uh potatoes that we grew on uh jose from argentina did the branding um and in the next slide you'll see we have a lot of youth ambassadors from around the world and uh, greta um, she's she's in Australia and she's uh, working on getting the Geelong City Council just outside Melbourne to endorse. And then on the left, you see Genesis Butler. She's a social media influencer. Um, in the next slide, you'll see uh, the, the, the three core principles. So again, we mirrored what the fossil fuel treaty has, which is, it has three, pro three principles. The first one is don't make the problem worse. So in our case, we came up with uh, our science advisor, Natasha, coined these like three R's. We thought that would be good. And so the first one is relinquish, like don't make the problem worse. No new deforestation for animal agriculture, no new animal farms, no new slaughterhouses. And then the second principle is redirect, like solve the problem, um, you know, redirect subsidies and policies, taxes, public information and campaigns from, from and promoting animal agriculture to now promoting the solution, which is, you know, plant-based food system. And then the third principle is restore, and that is re reforest the earth, um, heal the planet, you know, the mangrove forests and all the, uh, um, all the, uh, all the ecosystems. Um, we have a number of uh, scientists that have helped us from the start. Uh, we have these two IPC scientists. Uh, you may have heard of Dr. Peter Carter because he was interviewed by XR founder um, on Extinction Rebellion. Uh, he's vegan and he's, he's, he's an IPCC reviewer. Uh, my former pre professor, Danny Harvey at the University of Toronto, he's, he's helped us along the way. So our treaty is very science-based. We always track all the principles. We, we work with the IPCC um, reports in informing it. 
Um, if you see the next slide, I'll just go over um, our, our strategy, which is basically creating bottom-up pressure on by by getting endorsements from millions of individuals, from scientists, celebrities, athletes, businesses, groups, and cities, and you know, create all this grassroots pressure on, on national governments to to negotiate a global treaty. Um, Thanks for uh, putting the, on the banner the, the website. So if you just go to that website, yeah, you can you can endorse the treaty as an individual, group, business, or city. Um, and in the next slide, uh, you'll see these are our main targets for, for by 2023, uh, which is the year that the Paris Accords do a stock take and see how well they're doing in terms of meeting their um, targets of not exceeding the 1.5 celsius temperature which if that in itself is disastrous because you already the current warming is so horrible as you as you know um so what's good about the plant-based treat would not only allow us to not exceed the 1.5 degrees celsius if we also get a fossil fuel tree but it also is a solution where we can go down like we can actually start cooling the earth by reforesting it and absorbing the carbon out of the atmosphere so basically those are uh, by 2023 we've only got 50 cities and 10,000 businesses. We already have about 300 businesses, 500 organizations, over 20,000 individual signed, and five cities. And uh, in the next slide, um, uh, you see some of the celebrities that have endorsed. At COP, we, we had additional celebrities endorsed. We were so happy that the McCartneys, Paul, Mary, and Stella McCartney endorsed. Um, okay. yeah. yeah. And uh, here you see some of the other celebrities. I like, I like Rodrigo and Gabriella there. We got them. Uh, yeah, they, they, Rodrigo and Gabriella are vegan musicians. You love their music. You love them. Yeah. Absolutely fabulous. Yeah. They're fantastic. And, and Peter Regan there is a, is a big favorite of ours. Pete has been a staunch veg yeah. fest. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, Rodrigo and Gabriella, they won a Grammy Award in 2020. Uh, and they're vegan instrument for the best instrumental uh, album. So, I strongly recommend you check out their site. And they own a vegan restaurant in Mexico. Um, in the next, and Sada Sayed also owns a vegan restaurant in Mumbai uh, called Earth, Earth yeah. Cafe. So a lot of these people also do so much more. Uh, like Moby, you know, uh, is uh, doing uh, documentaries on social movements. Um, in the next slide, uh, you'll see uh, how we're science based. So the, uh, you know, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, known as the IPCC, uh, was set up decades ago, um, I think it was in maybe 19, 1988, uh, and basically its role is to assess the science. So there's three working groups, one on science, one on impacts, and one on policies. And when it was set up in 1988, it was the UK that was to chair the science, the science working group, the US. No, no, sorry, it was back then it was the Soviet Union to chair the impacts, and then uh, the response strategies were to be chaired by the U.S. And so uh, Dr. Houghton did the first IPC scientific assessment in 1990 with a, with a team of scientists around the world. And basically what they do is they look at all the peer-reviewed articles on this science of climate, and then they put it together and assess it. And, uh, and based on the cons consensus, they advise governments on what to do. So the, the latest assessment, the sixth assessment, came out in August of this year. And it, it was code red for humanity, according to the UN Secretary General. And that the way we're going with business as usual, we're going to hit 1.5 degrees Celsius warming by 2030, a disastrous, a catas catastrophic two degrees by 2040. Uh, the, the Guardian came out with an article one week before the release of the IPCC, uh, sixth assessment and said we're, we have a methane emergency and if you look at the IPCC report 30 percent of methane emissions are from animal agriculture so um and the thing is that all three greenhouse gas emissions are accelerating they're just going up every year there's more and more emissions for methane nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide so we the IPCC said that we have five years at best to change course. That's why we need a fossil fuel treaty and a plant-based treaty. And we need to 
radically change you know, the way we're doing, um, you know, how we use energy, what how we produce energy, and also ma massive changes in the food system. And we have to, according to Peter Carter, we have to rapidly um, uh, end fossil fuels, fossil fuel use, and animal agriculture. We have to rapidly end it and transition to new, new systems. Um, if you could show the next slides. Uh, um, what are the policy implications? Uh, so uh, Durwood Zalpi, he was uh, one of the lead reviewers for the IPCC. He said cutting methane is the biggest opportunity to slow warming between now and 2040. We need to face this emergency. So, we, so if we want to focus on methane in the near term, we have to address animal agriculture. And we need to quickly phase out animal agriculture and fossil fuels, according to IPCC scientists. Um, Peter Carter. Um, next slide, please. So um, what what we like about the fossil fuel treaty model that we've used in the current plant-based treaty model is, uh, you know, it's based on the science. And in this case, the science matches the ethics that a lot of us have been promoting for a long time. It, it completely matches it. And uh, it's, it's remarkable, really. And I, I think of Leo Tolstoy's quote, when you wish to harm others, you really do evil to yourself. And I think when we're harming animals, we are, you know, we're, that's going to lead to our extinction unless we change. Um, it's easy for politicians to act upon. The treaty has all, it has draft resolutions that you can see on our campaign hub and, and present to your counselor and mayor so they can pass. So it's already designed. Um, it has a lot of guides on how to lobby politicians. And in our case, what we're calling for is both individual change and system change. And, you know, at the, in the intro, Tim, you were saying how maybe a critique of the animal rights movement is somehow we, you know, we're not, we're, we haven't been able to create these big tents or to focus on government policy. And what's good about this particular model is you can do both the individual change, you know, diet change, not climate change approach as well as the system change. It's sort of like a meta campaign, which you can have a thousand campaigns under. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so in England, as you mentioned also, there's an early date motion that, that was introduced uh, um, in September. And currently we have 19 uh, MPs uh, that have uh, signed this early date motion. Um, it was... Um, in the motion, uh, it says that this house welcomes the plant-based treaty aiming to put food, sy food systems at the heart of combating the climate crisis by encouraging a shift to healthier and sustainable plant-based diets, while simultaneously working to reverse the damage to ecosystems and biodiversity. And calls on the government to use COP26 in Glasgow as an opportunity to be a world leader in recognizing the negative impacts of industrial animal agriculture on climate change. Um, uh, in, in Australia also has uh, an early day motion, uh, sorry, a motion that was introduced by Animal Justice Party, Emma, MP Emma Hurst. And uh, on our website, if you go to mypastreview.org, under actions, you can send an open letter to your councillors and um, to, the, to your mayor, as well as to MPs to, to sign the early day motion. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a quick timeline and uh, for this campaign. We met with Sephora uh, in April. We launched four months later because we had this great model. Uh, so it was very so we replicated it, uh, and then uh, within a week, the first city endorsed the treaty. That's Rosario in Argentina. Then in a, a few days later, the city of Boynton Beach in Florida became the second city to endorse. Um, in the UK, within two weeks of the launch, we have Emma. We have Emma Lewell Buck uh, from the Labour Party introducing the early day motion, and now we have 19 that signed on, 19 MPs. And next slide, um, uh, we, um, we 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 attended the conference of the youth just before COP, and then we were at COP, and uh, um, and then we're working towards the global stock take 2023 and getting. A lot more endorsements as well as uh, um, trying to implement the treaty. 
um, you know, sort of, sort of outside the call process as well. Um, in the next slide, you'll see uh, uh, the cities there, Fort the Beach is covered in the, the New Times and the Florida paper. Um, and then the next slide, uh, um, talk a bit about COP26, and then in these, you can go sort of quickly through these slides. I just want to show you some of the pictures from COP. Um, in the next slide, you'll see um, one of the things that uh, Alex Bork helped us with, you know, um, he has this wonderful book on a uh, you know, vegan guide, and he was also a runner-up in, in your awards. Um, but he, he did a plant-based treaty guide to Glasgow. Now, there's his book, The Vegan Guide. Uh, by Alex Bork. He, he did this wonderful guide when we yes. tens of thousands of copies <clears throat> over 20 vegan restaurants in downtown Glasgow. So, yeah, so he, that we, we distributed these guides to all the vegan restaurants, to the COP delegates, and they loved it. I mean, they used it a lot, and we also had a cl critical mass and lights show, so I'll just, if you go the next few slides, I'll show you some of the other things that we did, like restaurant takeovers and um, and in the next slide, you'll see uh, we had this inflatable cow, cow in the room. Um, it says stop animal farming, and the other side says endorse the plant based treaty. Uh, in the next slide, uh, the, this, this, we, had, we, we had it in a few of the cafes in Glasgow, along with uh, at the University of Stride class. class. We, we put the banners and the cow, and uh, over 500 individuals endorsed it when we were there. Um, in the next slide, you'll, uh, you'll see other cafes, and then the next slide. Um, so we were at the critical uh, mass bike ride, and there you see Emma Phipps, yeah, and she met Paul Sweeney, a Scottish MP, um, and asked them, to, and there's Kat as well. Kat is a local uh, vegan activist. Um, and then the next slide, we did the plant-based treaty dance using Rodrigo and Gabriela's song, uh, uh, Electric Soul, the beautiful instrumental piece. And we use that as a, so if you go on our plant-based treaty YouTube channel, you can, you can see it. Uh, next one, next slide. Uh, what, I, what I thought was so moving is that the team that went to Glasgow went to the slaughter, the cow slaughterhouse, and then they later found a pig slaughterhouse and did a vigil. So they sort of, combined you know our work on climate activism with the animal vigils and uh yeah so if you go through the next few slides you'll just see some of the pictures from this so this is a pig slaughterhouse that uh, and this these these images to me are just like just the most powerful moving i mean these are these beautiful individuals who are going to slaughter and it's really important to be there for them, and uh, it's life changing. And I, you know, if you haven't been to a vigil, I strongly recommend that you go to a slaughterhouse animal vigil. Um, I, it cha can change your life. So this is a Fridays for Future march at Glasgow that activists participated in. Yeah, the next few slides show some more pictures. Great attendance. Greta Thunberg was there, and we have we have uh, again these, this merch that says "Eat plants, plant trees." Um, endorsed the plant-based treaty. Um, just a, when in Glasgow, we, a number of celebrities helped us. Just wanted to show you that in the next few slides. So there's Chris Packham, organized by the Vegan Society. They, uh, they had a, an event at a vegan pub. Uh, they also met with John Robb and uh, also the um, Dale Vins of Ecotricity. The next slide, um, um, they met with, they, they ran into uh, Ed Miliband, the former leader of the Labour Party at the, at the protest. Next slide. Um, so D Dale Vince of Ecotricity and the Green Rovers joined us for a press conference at COP. And then Ivana Lynch, actress, she joined our press conference with a video message which you also can see on the Plant-Based Treaty YouTube channel. So they just wonderful support from um, business leaders and, and celebrities. Uh, we really appreciated it because it got us a lot of media. It was interesting because we did a lot of different actions, but it's the celebrities like Moby, McCartney's, Vanna Lynch, the 
got us the most media. What do we, you know, yeah. So the next slide, please. Uh, so this is some of the media. We also got media for the inflatable cow. Uh, um, and in the in the first picture there, you could see the Glasgow con the conference center in the backdrop. And in this case, in the in the second picture, it's in Georgia Square in downtown Glasgow. But it was we got media in a lot of major papers, including the Guardian, and a lot of entertainment uh, press because of the departments and Moby. Um, next slide, please. So for our next steps, uh, we were looking to uh, recruit campaigners in different cities and teams in cities. And we have a plant-based treaty work plan that can guide people to try to get their cities to endorse, and, you know, get get their schools to veganize their menus or you know, create community gardens and plant trees. Um, and we're building alliances and we're reaching out uh, to a lot of different groups. And uh, it, it's been incredible, as you said, in COP, there was a lot of collaboration and uh, all the successes we've had, we're so dependent on working with others. So in defense of animals in the US, uh, we secured us Mac the McCartney's endorsement. We worked with Viva, the vegan society and just humane society, so many different groups, uh, like never before, like Animal Save Movement is over 10 years old. And we've had a lot of support from PETA and other groups for individual cases, but never before were we able to like work with so many different groups. Um, and, and so that's been wonderful. So yeah, so that that's the end of the presentation. So thank you. Oh, thank you. The, uh, and, and on that note, especially <clears throat> the collaborations was really loud and clear. And you're right, it is never before. It was really noticeable. It's something, something uh, commented on yesterday for our award ceremony was the example set by uh, the, the groups at COP26, uh, the collaborations there from the people you mentioned, uh, Animal Aid, Viva, Animals Equality, Vegan Organic Network, Plant-Based Treaty, obviously, Vegan Society, and with the removal of the um, livestock farming issue from the from the agenda, you know, we it, it became it became the duty and the task of, of these groups and those individuals you showed there, you know, like Ivana and, and Dale, um, maybe you know, to 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 really spearhead that issue is to make sure that issue was firmly on the agenda and, and I took my hat to all of these people I and mean, the power of collaboration and it's not easy in the animal justice movement you know they we've seen people struggle between animal justice and, and climate justice there's there's a lot that overlaps but there's some important bits that are, are separate but, but, but keeping clear and keeping being honest and perhaps not conflating these uh, allows us those platforms like you said, to, 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 to visit slaughterhouses and keep the, the justice for animals position clearly in the what can sometimes be a reductionist approach. Uh, animals can kind of get thrown under the bus, they still get commodified in the climate justice where they're still reduced to being numbers and, and you know, statistics, whereas of course we know that these are, these are individuals. And, and the ability to keep this you know in the picture is is you know, credit credit to 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 yourselves as an organization for achieving that because um yeah well, we, 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 in many know, respects it's a first yeah and it's been tremendously encouraging yeah it's been uh, very it's been wonderful because I, I like in the climate movement you know the animals are referred to as livestock and we absolutely never refer to sure. them as property and so it's really important that we enter the field and always correct people and start changing the discourse and the narrative. Uh, um, you know, the root cause of the climate crisis is how we treat na nature and other animals. Like that's the root mm -hmm. cause. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we can bring to the conversation. Because right now, if you just look at the climate movement, that isn't part of the, the conversation. No. So, we are are science based, but we also bring our ethics in into the discussion. Um, 
But we do so in a, a very non-judgmental way. It's a very, it's a big tent approach where it was carefully drafted. You know, the three principles were very carefully drafted um, to just encourage anyone to join. So like 40% of the people that endorse are not vegan. So that we welcome that. Do you know the key issue though, I think, just, just from observing it and listening to your presentation, the bit that really stood out that I think is different that marks you out, which may be a key as to why you've achieved this, such a such a quick support, is because, and I think, I'm, I'm not saying this is unique, but I've noticed this is absent sometimes, is that the, for, for tackling systemic change, we have to recognise the importance of individual change. Um, if, if we're not promoting individual change, we're at conflict uh, with systemic change. But, but, and as you there said, you know, 40% of people are not yet vegan there. You know, the importance of individual change should be not at the expense though, of excluding or pushing away. So we have to somehow incorporate and include and be inclusive and supportive, seek those learning outcomes. But but be clear, but be clear that you know we're not we're not it's not okay to use animals. Be that as an individual or an institution, or we're talking governments or systems. You know, veganism is a position we take against the commodification of animals, and, and we can we can include that. And I think, without wanting to be judgmental, but possibly where so many other uh, similar groups who really tried to do this have, have you know ignored the importance of individual change because of perhaps fear that oh we may lose a lot of support that we want possibly but but you seem to have achieved that by including individual change while still demanding systemic change and i think that's a really key call um, yeah i you know I, also like like we face an emergency and it, yeah. it's like it's not a time for half measures no you know, we're in, living in a time of consequences so yeah. You know, people are calling for half measures like like Cargill is one of the biggest slaughterhouse companies is calling yeah. for face masks for cows like this, the, the insanity of these kind of proposals. And so we can call that out. And we're, you know, and another campaign that we have is called Stop Animal Gifting. And I was wondering if Pete could put that banner across and just I'm just wondering if everyone could please support our Stop Animal Gifting campaign. And it's related to this plant based treaty because the first principle is don't make the problem worse. Principle one is um, relinquish, you know, no more slaughterhouses. We said no more animal farms. We didn't say no more industrial animal farms. We said no more animal farms because um, a, a companies like Cargill are partnering with Heifer International, which is a charity that tries to commodify animals. And uh, it, its mission is to make animals into a business. And what they're doing is uh, trying to get people in India Mexico, Kenya, to adopt backyard chicken operations. But they want to get 100 million people to do that by 2030. And uh, this is like, so they, they've infiltrated the grassroots. So it's like an astroturf movement. They try to talk about women's empowerment and work with women's self-help groups in India. And they're in, in the state of Odisha, which is uh, mostly plant-based, the tribal communities are plant-based. They've now entered there and are they have goat passing, uh, chicken, backyard chickens, and having eggs in schools before, you know, students were eating healthy, like lentils and chickpeas, and they introduced eight, like two eggs per student, and they're trying to get India to increase the per capita chicken and egg, cons egg consumption, and so we're, we're taking that on, uh, you know, this is where you should, it just shows, it just proves how close ethics and science are matched, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, and it's industrial, you know. Yeah. And it's the same in health too. When we talk about health and diets and whole food diets, you know, whole food plant based diets, it's just really ha 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 handy that oh, nearly all the science supports, you know. Uh, and, and of course, the science too is really good at pinpointing little areas where maybe, oh, guess what, you know, a little addition here or there, maybe in this case, plant based diets, you have a supplement to, oh, you know, that, that can lead to optimum health and wow, how fabulous, you know. Um, so, so we're really lucky on that, yeah. And the same with sustainable food supply. You know, the, the science supports yeah. a, a shift to plant-based systems. Um, yeah. 
Anita, we've been chatting for a little bit. Um, we've been actually chatting for two whole days with some most fabulous and interesting guests. So I will just point though, we did feature um, the Plant Based Treaty in COP26 quite, quite extensively in our recent issue of Plant Power Planet magazine, um, and including contributions. I'd just like to say thanks to Alex Bork, who uh, was the, the original person who got in touch with us to suggest this. And then also Nicola, Nicola Harris, who um, put us in touch and Nicola wrote an article for us for Plant Based Treaty for Plant Power Planet. So uh, Pete, I don't know if you might just run, plantpowerplanet.co.uk is not actually our website address. You can find us on the vegfest.co.uk page, actually, Plant Power Planet. You can read about uh, all of the COP26 stuff too there from the vegan site in the, that's, that's, that's brilliant. Um, but obviously work to do. Um, so Anita, we'll, we'll keep in touch. And this is this is quite a fast growing campaign. I think we just saw last week actually, in the last few days, the Netherlands has announced the Dutch government and now got a whole subsidy system for trans, transitioning live, livestock farming to plant-based plant farming or other such like. So that's almost like a, a world first, I think. Um, possibly, but, uh, we, we might leave that for another time, perhaps in March when we have another Global Veg Fest. We also have a live event next November, November 12th, 13th. We're back to our live events at Olympia. Uh, of course, we'll be welcoming the Plot based Treaty. Thank you. That, yes, I just thank you for the, the magazine. Uh, it's yeah. a beautiful spread, a number of yeah, pages. Thank you. <laughs> it was wonderful. Well, thank you, Anita, and thank you for giving us all hope. We're going to wrap up, but we're wrapping up for 2021 on a, a real ending on a message of hope because that progress that you know plant based treat has made is is i think really giving people hope um and and the 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 one we had before oh ellen's little completing eating oh that's a really good trick you can see why they kind of go hand in hand because it's a very empowering for our communities and it takes back the power from the abuse of some of the systems and institutions puts it back in the hands of the people. And I think that's a really important message that, that we are self-empowered by this. We need to be, uh, but we also need strong leadership and organisations like Plant Based Treaty uh, are providing that, just that, so. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, and thank you all. Great to talk to you. Thank you. For Plant Based Treaty. Okay, that's it. I'm gonna say goodbye. And we say goodbye on a lovely note. And so thank you all the people who've helped uh, with Global Veg Fest this last couple of days, all the people you've collaborated with, contributed, especially too, for our man Pete here, working hard, who's been working flat out to get the show running in the background. Well done, Pete. We won't ask you to pop up and wait for everyone, but I will give you an online provisional wave there and a little bit of thanks. So. Thanks, folks. Good luck. We'll see you in 22.